This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. We begin with this week's grain market update from K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. This week, Dan highlights China's preference for Brazilian soybeans over the U.S. crop and tension still with Mexico with their potential change in demand for U.S. corn. Also ahead with high highs and low lows in the world of weather, many may be wondering how our Kansas wheat is holding up. Joining me to cover that subject is K-State multi-county agronomist for Northwest Kansas, Janie Falk-Jones. Janie shares that while the wheat has been through a lot this year, there is still hope for the resilient crop. We end with some optimistic news during this week's agricultural weather report from K-State meteorologist Chip Redman. Chip shares that nearly all of the state received some much-needed moisture, with snowfall totals of 7 to 10 inches in some areas. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are beginning today's show with our weekly grain market update. And of course, for that, we are joined by K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. So Dan, before we get into things, thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity, Samantha. Absolutely. We're kicking off this Friday, as we always do with our grain market programming, starting with futures outlook. So let's walk through our futures and what we're really seeing there right now. We've had a volatile week. When you look at at what's been happening the last several days, for, if I'll start with on the corn market, we uh, had dropped about 660 back up to close yesterday at 682. And now in our recent experience, that's a little bit of volatility. That's not the big stuff. You know, we're moving 50 cents over or a dollar over one or two days. Still with the recent volatility, we're still within the recent trading range of about, about 690 to about 660. Closed yesterday at 682 and a half led by concerns over Argentina, Argentina's drought. Some concern you and I spoke off air about, yes, I, I understand it's dry in Argentina. And in, in the middle and northern parts of Brazil, it's it's wet. They get, have great crop prospects. I wonder about the middle, receive different reports. I, I'd like to see how that works out. Still, though, you have a generally... Even in, in, the, in the longer run, just a little bit of a sideways to slightly higher market for corn. And you look at the Kansas seasonal price trends. This is a time frame when we're just about matching what happens from January into March with sideways to a little bit higher. And of course, most of the volatility and movement when we do see stronger prices kind of crescendos into April, then May and then June. And then where are we going? So that's kind of the issue there. I would say for wheat, recent price trends for wheat have also been volatile. In fact, uh, we had dropped down to about 8, 810, 8, 808 there. So there about in the last few days. And now jumped back up to 864 and three quarters. So gracious for, for a market that doesn't have a lot going on in terms of supply demand changes, it's still pretty volatile. My office is out in western Kansas, happens to be in Colby. We try to, of course, stay stay in tune with the whole state. We've got some moisture of late. And uh, a number of my agronomic friends uh, and colleagues are busily trying to assess what our opportunities are. From an economist's point of view, we tend to have a lot of volatility in March when when we break dormancy. And I'm sure our colleagues, again, will be uh, on top of that. And they'll ask questions about uh, root development, tiller, tillering opportunities, and, and all of that. So we're still just so-so on exports. It, it'll be a crop issue for us in terms of what we have for in the hard red area. And I would say if for trends on the uh, on the soybean market, also volatile, but the volatility in the soybean market kind of overpowers volatility in the corn and, and the wheat right now. It, it, within the last two weeks, we traded down as low as about about 1460 up to about 1550 and, and we just bounce around 20 30 cents in a day well yes we're concerned but it's not that big a deal compared to the volatility in the others and generally we're in a long-term uptrend for all the way from last september and so why is that well yeah we have this great crop coming on in at least the northern two-thirds of brazil but argentina's crop uh, looks to be damaged by the same dry conditions intermittent rains but still not recovering greatly and uh most recent export numbers 69 million bushels we need about 23 24 to meet the usda's projections of course that's all going to change when the brazilian crop whatever they have does come out of the field will cut down some but again argentina's not in the game 
So I, I'm really curious to see uh, whether our pace falls off to some of the other levels that we tend to see it fall off to in a normal year when we've got both Argentina and Brazil there. We hear reports that China has really uh, determined, has given a preference for buying South American soybeans. I understand that. However, they've been a, a pretty healthy buyer of U.S. soybeans of late as well. So if we look at the futures prices, cash prices. Before we do um, the cash, Dan, the, yeah. when it comes to China's preference, is there a reason for that? Is it just because of kind of, you know, the U.S. dollar where it stands right now? Is that really the reason there? Well, there are market factors like the U.S. dollar that could come into play, and the dollar is certainly higher than that for than than the Brazilian currency. So that is true. I think um, if you remember not too long ago, what within last year or so, we had a major trade row with China, and they had committed to buying X amount of crops to fulfill their commitments uh, that they'd had prior. Well, they we had to change the political leadership. They backed off of that. So I think, and I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I think geopolitical influences may have something to do with that. They're still buying from the United States, but we're more of a, I guess, a, a competitor in a number of areas, geopolitical areas with China. And with that all on the table, if they have the opportunity to buy to buy any quantity from these other South American countries, they've shown a preference in the last one or two years to do it before they've come to the U.S. Sure. Well, that makes sense. So still some hard feelings there politically, like you mentioned that, you know, we're not going to speculate about here, but that makes sense. You and I, we can navigate that without uh, starting another one of those conflicts. Yes. Sure, sure. <laughs> so now that we've covered that, let's go ahead and move into the local cash markets where we know we won't cause any trouble there. <laughs> All right. Hopefully. Well, I, I would say that we still maintain a strong cash market in Southwest Kansas. Top bids, $8.13, and that's a dollar thirty-one over the March futures contract. So going strong there, really the second strongest Contract bid, at least one bid with some others about 10, 15 cents below it, is in southeast Kansas. So demand pull from southeastern states pulling corn out of Kansas. The uh, Hutchinson area had a 89 cent over bid, second, maybe the third highest. And then you've got Colby at the highest uh, elevator bid, 76 over uh, Salina, Topeka, 4666. So really still pretty strong that we are watching new crop bids too. Well, not surprisingly, the strongest new crop bids are in the Garden City area, 45 over, but second strongest actually in Hutchinson at even money. So sorghum, generally positive, tends to trail the corn bids on the cash market in most of these areas by about anywhere from 5 to 10 to 20 cents. So, but still positive basis bids for sorghum. Uh, soybean bids, we've kind of grown numb now to saying, well, we've got a, a 15.23 bid in Salina and a 15.40 in Hutchinson, 15.43 in Topeka. And I remember talking about beans in the teens. Well, we're here and we're not even worried about it. <laughs> you know, it's not a surprise. So strong bean markets for the reasons we talked about. Wheat, Cash markets for wheat ranging across the state, 811 per bushel in the southeast, up to uh, 860 in the Salina area, and strong bids, 850s, Hutchinson, uh, 840, Topeka, 833, Colby, 840 in Garden City. So pretty strong wheat bids. So I look at these bids and have all this uncertainty out in front of us in terms of what the crop will actually be and then wonder where we'll go. Before we wrap up today's segment, I thought we'd end with a bit of a corn supply and demand comment. We've got some interesting word coming out of Mexico that we might not be having as strong of demand from them as we're used to soon. There's really a back and forth between the United States and the Mexican government about GMO corn and uh this has evolved over time. At first, all corn exports are going to be shut off from the U.S. to Mexico. And again, Mexico's number one destination for U.S. corn. It's a short boat or train ride there. So it's real uh, locational advantages. But the last numbers that I've heard or that we've seen reported in the popular ag press were that there could be as much as a 30 or 40 percent reduction in U.S. corn going to those areas. So I don't know. I, I think that uh, we're talking about a, a lot of possibilities, but I, I wonder what the realities will be in those markets once uh, in, in that Mexican market, once we really get, get down to determining whether they can find the supplies of the type of corn that they want or that they're idealizing that they would like to have from around the world. 
I guess I read a lot of skepticism about them being able to achieve that. Not that we can't continue to provide yellow corn for their livestock industry, but then uh, when you start talking about food consumption, white corn, non-GMO, et cetera, how many people in quantity are in, in these production systems that we're dealing with, are we going to be able to provide or who can grow corn without herbicides or without insecticide coverage that GMO provides, et cetera, and, and still not have a food shortage in some of these other countries, particularly Mexico? Sure, and our agronomists to figure out if that is, you know, the situation we end up with, if we can tackle that and feasibly do it. So interesting for sure. And I know you're going to be covering topics just like this and more at our upcoming online Kansas Corn Schools. I've previewed the Kansas Corn Schools before. All of the in-person events have pretty much taken place, I believe, by this point. But the online (laughs) portion is still to come, right? Yes. As I recall, I think on Thursday, February the 2nd, at 6 p.m., we'll have an online Kansas Corn School. We have a lineup of speakers. I'll have a concise, to the point, uh, market rip on corn in particular. And, of course, we'll have more information, I think, on this uh, very issue of Mexico-U.S. trade relations, as well as a number of other percolating issues in the corn market. Wonderful. Well, Dan, I'll link to that so people that are interested can learn more and register potentially if they're wanting to attend that event. So a great opportunity to learn more. And Dan, I think before we get ourselves in any more trouble, this might be a good place for us to end today. (laughs) Yes. Well, you you know, this is what happens in January, February. We're dealing with demand issues and any of these policy issues, it affects demand. Once we get into April, we'll start talking about crop production again. (laughs) But right now we're just, we're going over demand issues and any of these discussions on bioenergy or food consumption, they all have an impact. As always, Dan, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Samantha. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Once again, that was K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien joining us for this week's grain market update. We'll be back with more ahead on agriculture today. Today, we are joined now by Janie Falk Jones. She is our K State multi county agronomist for Northwest Kansas. And she's joining us today for a conversation surrounding around one of our favorite crops here in Kansas it's wheat. So, I figured with all of the changes that we've had this winter season, with how weather has gone, temperatures, it was time for a wheat update. So, Janie, first and foremost, thanks so much for joining us today. Happy to join. Well, I appreciate your time as always. Like I said, let's talk through some of the strange, I guess would be a good term to use here, our strange weather that we've been experiencing in Kansas. You know, dry conditions are not anything super abnormal for western Kansas. At the same time, it's been pretty extremely dry when we look back to last fall when we were getting wheat drilled into the ground and the very dry conditions that we were drilling into. And so we have a lot of variability in the stands that we got last fall. And so that enters into what we're thinking about moving into this coming spring. And, you know, we had some wheat that was pretty well established, had fall tillers, two to three fall tillers on those plants and had good root systems under them. We had other fields that may be just down the road, actually, that were in very dry conditions and a wheat that hadn't even germinated last fall because it was in such dry conditions. And we had everything in the middle of that continuum. And so some wheat that had germinated, not emerged. We had wheat that was emerged, but just barely. And so those very dry conditions really are setting the stage of where our wheat is going to be coming out this spring. When we're thinking about some of that situation going into kind of the middle to the end of December, we had some extremely cold temperatures here in far northwest Kansas where we had, I think, three nights where we had worse than negative 10 degrees down to negative 14, I think, in some of the locations, according to the Kansas Mesonet. And so when we're thinking about those very cold temperatures, that 
raises cause for concern because when we have very dry soils, that temperature swing is more extreme than if we have moist soils. And that's because the moist soils will kind of help buffer some of those soil temperature changes. And so we knew we had some wheat that was planted pretty shallow and didn't have well-established root systems. And then with those cold temperatures on top of it. And so in some cases, we're kind of have a little bit of an additive effect on, on some of that stress that those plants are seeing. So that all enters into when we think about how it's going to be uh, starting to green up this coming spring. Sure. Yeah. I know we had cases where we were even worried about winter wheat kill. I think that's, you know, a term that gets thrown around and people are like, you know, red flags and (laughs) alarms start going off in people's minds. So the December time period was a great example of that. And then after that precipitation and that cold snap we had, things were kind of, again, abnormal. We saw some warmer temperatures. It was like another little mini drought period that we had for a while there. But I feel like the script kind of flipped in the past several weeks. We got a lot of precipitation. Well, I say a lot, a lot for us as of lately, as we've been experiencing this drought across a lot of the state and things are getting, you know, back to normal temperatures that we would expect this time of year. So falling into those normal patterns, what does this mean for our wheat as it stands right now? You know, we're extremely thankful for any type of moisture that we've been catching and we have, you know, snow cover and and a big portion of the area in western Kansas and we're thankful for every bit of that. Um, In some cases that snow, some of those snows that we've been having coming through the area have had some pretty decent moisture in them. Others have been extremely dry and so I did look at the National Weather Service uh, information in Goodland and for the month of January it says that we're up to 85 hundredths of an inch of rain which is very exciting. We're happy to have every bit of that but we have to put it in context is that we are in a situation looking back for the last 365 days in some places we're over 10 inches below normal and so this moisture is great because we're just happy to have every bit of it. We're also still kind of fighting from a deficit area on some of this and so you know we are happy to have it because it's going to help support some of that root growth and growth of spring tillers as we're moving forward. Although at the moment, you know, our wheat is very much in a dormant period. And so while it is still having respiration out in the field, it's very slow and we're not seeing a lot of growth. And so we won't really see a lot of the visual effects of this moisture until we start to warm up in the spring, but we're really happy to have it now. And I know some people are anxious to see how this wheat is going to come out in the spring. If you want to, go shovel some snow and dig up some wheat and bring it in and see how it greens up. I think that's a good thing to do if people are concerned about it, but we're just really kind of in a period where we're in a wait and see period on how we're going to move forward with this. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great tip to dig some up and bring it inside. Kind of a a way of, you know, you know, kids peek at their Christmas presents prior to (laughs) Christmas time. Sometimes it's almost a bit of that for our producers that are out there producing wheat in Kansas. So that was a great piece of advice for sure. And like you said, we still have quite a while to go until things warm up for our state. And there's still a lot of anticipation on, well, are we going to continue to have, you know, much needed timely rain? Is this like script, like I said earlier, actually flipping? Are we actually moving? Moving into a period where we're not going to be using the word drought as often. And I think that we're still playing that by ear, right? I think very much so. You know, in, in listening to our meteorologist, Chip Redmond, he has, you know, at least a little bit more of a positive outlook than what I've been hearing from him lately. And so, you know, we are just taking the first steps of filling some profile moisture and really supporting some, some growth that would be out there for this wheat and then stopping to think about when we're planting some summer crops, but we know that we are still probably deficit for profile moisture and and moving forward with that. But we're just extremely happy to have the snow cover that we have now. It's also helping to stop some of the soil that we've had blowing this winter and things along those lines. And so thinking about our wheat crop, you know, you never want to count out a wheat crop. We always talk about it being the crop with nine lives. Some would say we've ran through a few of those already uh, trying to get to this point in the growing season. But the wheat that is still very small, or that is um, not emerged yet. We do have some research that says, you know, if we have um, potential of maybe a half or a 50% yield of what we would have over the stuff that was well established in the fall, but our spring is really going to determine how some of this wheat moves forward just because we're heavily going to be relying on moisture that is coming in a timely manner this spring to kind of help keep that wheat crop moving along. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So still a lot to come on where we actually end up with with this crop. And I know a lot of producers are anxiously awaiting spring, much like I am myself. And I'm sure you are as well, Janie. But thank you so much for this update. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, happy to do so. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was Janie Falk-Jones. She is our multi-county agronomist for Northwest Kansas here at K-State, joining us for a wheat update. Before we cut to a short break, we're now going to hear from Scarlett Hagens with the Kansas Livestock Association. According to National Cattlemen's Beef Association Chief Counsel Mary Thomas Hart, the new waters of the U.S. definition is an attack on farmers and ranchers. She said the rule removes longstanding bipartisan exclusions for small and isolated water features on farms and ranches and adds to the regulatory burden cattle producers are facing under the Biden administration. NCBA previously had filed technical comments on the rule, highlighting the importance of maintaining agricultural exclusions for small, isolated, isolated and temporary water features like ephemeral streams that only flow during limited periods of rainfall but remain dry the majority of the year. Regulating these features at the federal level under the Clean Water Act disrupts normal agricultural operations and interferes with cattle producers' ability to make improvements to their land. Last year, more than 1,700 individual cattle producers sent messages to the Environmental Protection Agency opposing the administration's overly broad definition of WOTUS. Producers also shared their views with the agency at a roundtable last June. Even EPA's own Farm, Ranch, and Rural Communities Advisory Committee urged the agency to consider a more limited rule. Unfortunately, the agency failed to incorporate the cattle industry's recommendations, and NCBA now is suing to stop this rule from harming producers. Hart said NCBA also is concerned that EPA charged headfirst on a controversial rulemaking while this very issue is currently before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case last October and is expected to release a decision in the coming months. I'm Scarlett Hagens. Once again, that was Vice President of Communications with the Kansas Livestock Association, Scarlett Hagens, providing a brief update on that EPA WOTUS definition. If you're listening to us on the radio and are afraid you're going to miss out on our next segment because you're reaching your destination or have something else that you're having to switch to quickly here, don't forget that Agriculture Today programming is also available as a podcast. Our podcast is easily accessible on all podcasting platforms, including our website, agtoday.net, as well as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. You can simply search us on any podcasting platform, Agriculture Today, Kansas State, and we are more than likely to pop up and you can follow us there. That way you can simply have us pop up in your regular feed on whatever platform you're using and listen to us more regularly that way. Once again, you can easily access that on agtoday.net or any podcasting platform by simply searching Agriculture Today, Kansas State. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Samantha Bennett and student intern Katie Figge, I'm Jeff Wickman. While we end this week's programming with a look at Kansas agricultural weather, K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond tells Katie that with the exception of the far southwest, the state benefited from much-needed moisture as some areas received as much as 7 to 10 inches of snow. So thanks for joining us today, Chip. Yep, thanks for having me. So I know in our previous conversation that you kind of wanted to talk about this past week's snow and rainfall. Yeah, we had, you know, another active week, really, especially for this time of year, where we kept getting several different storm systems. We had one come through over the last weekend that uh, brought some snow for folks. Unfortunately, didn't catch everybody in the state. That far southwest missed out again, but snow in the northwest and, and 
rain that began to snow in the uh, in the northeast and, and above normal moisture for pretty much everybody in the state except for that far southwest. So when we look at that, you know, we don't we don't average a whole lot of moisture this time of year. It's the driest time of, of the year for, for the entire state. But uh, average precipitation uh, is around two tenths to in the central part of the state, less in the in the west and, and more in the east. And everyone for the most part got about two to, to three tenths above normal uh, for the last week. And, and for snowfall amounts, you know, we had seven, eight inches, even a localized area of 10 inches in the, in the northwest from that storm system over the weekend. And then we had that second system come in here midweek that brought in uh, some lighter amounts, but uh, snow for south central and southeast Kansas. So with that snow and rainfall, we're looking at maybe a few areas becoming drought-free. Is that right? Yeah, so breaking news hot off the wire. Yesterday morning, the new drought monitor came out, and uh, the, the Manhattan region got dropped from abnormally dry, and improvements were made in the surrounding area as well that bumped moderate drought down to abnormally dry. So slowly but surely, parts of the state are getting added to drought-free areas, which is exciting. We haven't seen that, that much drought-free conditions since last October. We also had some bump up or improvements as well in the, uh, the northwest part of the state where it got an over an inch to two inches of moisture from the recent snows, which is much well above normal for them. And, and digging into their long-term deficits, they're still in moderate to uh, extreme drought out there, but a category improvement is an improvement. That is fantastic news. I think I've been waiting forever to hear about getting out of that drought weather Um, But let's talk about the upcoming weather for maybe some cold and drier conditions. Yeah, so after a very warm start to 2023, we uh, transitioned into a cooler weather pattern for the last week with this storm weather and a lot more cloud cover, too. It's been really gloomy. and Unfortunately, it doesn't look to really change much. We have another system coming in uh, this weekend that's going to bring a pretty dry cold front across the state, but it's going to significantly drop temperatures. You know, the state right now averages around the low 40s to 40 degrees for highs and, and around the 20-degree mark for lows. We're going to be about 20 degrees below that. So we're going to see highs in the 20s and lows around zero starting Sunday and into early next week. So much, much colder conditions. Unfortunately, that's out of the north, northwest. The winds will be, and that's where cold air comes from, and that's dry conditions for much of the state. We expect some flurries maybe. But overall, potential for any meaningful precipitation will be pretty low, and we expect to stay dry. Looking out beyond that, looks like we'll have a brief reprieve in the cold weather the second week of February, or at least the first full week. And then uh, we still have a lot of cold air to our west and north that is likely going to try to push south and east again by mid-February, and likely bring another period of below normal temperatures. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Chip. Yep, thanks for having me. Once again, that was Chip Redman, K-State Meteorologist, with our weekly agriculture weather update. Thanks, Katie. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Be sure to join us again on Monday or listen anytime by visiting agtoday.net and downloading the daily podcast. For Katie Figgy and Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.